Hi, good morning. I'm with Asad Malik and Jake Sally. Uh, they're both with uh, Jadu Jetpacks. We are here in New York City at Freeman Alley, not far away from Times Square, where NFT NYC is happening from November 1st to 4th, 2021. It's an awesome conference all about NFTs, movers, shakers, innovators, thought leaders. And speaking of thought leaders, uh, the gentleman here, uh, J Jadu Jetpacks, is uh, very well known in the gaming industry and the also the uh, metaverse. It is a product that took pretty much took the industry by storm. I was looking on OpenSea this morning and um, the floor price looks amazing for something you'd buy for like 0.11. Um, it basically allows you to fly around the metaverse with your own jetpack, which is really cool. I'm sure the whales are just loving something like this. And if I'm not mistaken, it was ami uh, initially created for the MeBits. But since we have both uh, Assad Malik and Jake Sally here, we're going to discuss not only uh, the product that everyone knows about, but they have something new they'll be introducing. And maybe we'll get a little inside scoop on that because it's happening tonight at Dreambird. So Assad. Hello. First, yeah, first I want to say thanks for taking the time, and uh, Jake here as well. Um, I know you're busy people. You have a lot going on. You have a big event tonight. So first, would you like to preface with um, an inter introduction into your company, the roles mm -hmm. you have, mm -hmm. and uh, where you see this going for yourselves? For sure. So, um, you know, I'm the CEO of Jadu. Um, you know, we really think of ourselves essentially as an augmented reality company. That's what we've been doing for the last five years. Um, you know, we have been very purist about AR. We've not actually even touched VR. Um, we've treat, treated AR as a medium on its own. And, you know, one of the big hurdles over the last five years has been finding business models that work for these new mediums that don't really exist yet, right? So for AR, you can't really do in-app purchasing or any of these kind of Web2 models that have existed. Um, you know, my personal definition of a native Web3 company is a company that did not have a business model and uh, that was a Web2 business model. So essentially we're building kind of an augmented reality oriented gaming world in which, you know, metaverse items can be brought into the physical world and you can basically experience them, interact with your space. And, you know, that's generally the direction we're heading over the next year, we're gonna be kind of building out our world further with all kinds of assets and, you know, in-game items and you know, uh, various avatars that exist in the metaverse would become playable characters in AR. So that's wow. kind of a gist of where we're taking things. That's um, fascinating. Would love for Jake to introduce himself as well. Yeah, and I'm Jake Sally. I'm the CEO of Jadu, um, managing day-to-day -day operations. And I wanted to just echo what Asad was saying of really for us, you know, we're coming at it from an augmented reality perspective first. And so for our first item, the Jadu Jetpack, the big question we had was how do we add utility to an NFT. Ha and for us, that was augmented reality, being able to let people fly through the metaverse, do something more than simply have it on their phone, have it as their Twitter profile picture, but give people more. That's fascinating. So tell me about this um, understanding um, of the culture right now, having your finger on the pulse and really identifying what your first product was going to be. Um, it seems like a no-brainer, yet at the same time, no one had done it previous. Um, tell me about the journey to create something like this and mm -hmm. what your background is to have the technical expertise to execute this product. Sure. So, um, you know, actually we were in New York uh, in 2018 when our first major project premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. Uh, we have a lot, a long history in doing augmented reality headset-based experiences. Um, that we would often take to Tribeca and Sundance and places like that. Um, and, you know, with that model, we were definitely able to kind of innovate and push forward the AR format. Um, you know, five years ago before we started, AR really wasn't a thing a normal person would kind of know about. Um, obviously now that has changed, but still people's perception of AR kind of comes from Snapchat and Instagram filters, which are very limited manifestations of what AR is supposed to be able to accomplish. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for us, our history has kind of been like pushing the envelope on AR and what the possibilities of AR are. So, you know, Jetpacks is kind of interesting because the, you know, the product wasn't the Jetpacks, the product was the app, right? We're building an AR platform called Jadu in which people can bring in their assets and, you know, be able to use them in completely new and novel manners. And Jetpacks became an excuse to do that. So, 
really the way we were thinking was, okay, well, we're gonna have avatars in our world that already exist. These are not our avatars. We don't wanna make avatars. We don't wanna sell our own avatars so people can use that. We actually wanna build like an open interoperable kind of space where people can bring their own assets in. So what is a horizontal kind of product that we can offer that people can use with various avatars that actually puts a lot of different avatars on an equal playing field so they can interact with each other, That's right? Awesome. Um, because like me bits are tiny and voids are tall and you know yeah. if they're all flying, they're all comparable. So Jetpacks was really kind of our first asset at you know building this kind of horizontal product. People often talk about the metaverse being this interoperable space, but we actually wanted to show how different characters can actually interact and engage with each other with a similar kind of uh, you know uh, NFT that they have in common. And yeah, since then Jetpacks really just exceeded our expectations as you were just saying about the floor and whatnot. You know, yeah. uh, my experience of it was I went to the minting website and the countdown timer ended and I tried to mint one to see if it, the contract's working. And I went to the Discord to announce that the minting was now public. And when I went back, uh, my transaction had failed because we had sold out before my test transaction. So and that was yeah. 1100 if I'm yeah, not mistaken. Yeah, we had one, 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 one total jetpacks. And yeah, they sold out in 20 seconds. And you know, since then have formed a really strong community of a lot of people that really believe in the platform that we're developing. And you know, the dynamic is that these people are now tied to Jadu and our success and our yeah. kind of teammates almost. So, so tell me in terms of scaling, because I see a really healthy uh, secondary market for them. People are obviously trading, swapping, whatever. Um, are you thinking of, of having maybe a 10,000 collection now, understanding the, the demand? And how have NFTs specifically affected your business model in all this? You know, has it um, changed the way that you've decided to operate or did mm -hmm. you enter the market knowing NFTs were gonna be the vehicle? Um, no, it's definitely changed uh, our whole company, right? Like. Uh, because, you know, we, as I said, we've been making AR for a long time, but we've been looking for a model that works. We've been looking for a model that makes sense for this new era that isn't really, you know, extractive in the same way that a lot of models of the past have been that really capitalize on attention and want you to go back again and again. We're trying to build something that doesn't really require you to be on it all at all times. And like, you know, the retention levels don't have to be crazy. Um, so, you know, it's a very different kind of dynamic that we've unlocked. As for the 10,000 items, you know, 10,000 is a pretty arbitrary number that has emerged out of like CryptoPunks being 10,000 and obviously yeah. that's become like the model. Yeah. You know, we're very flexible with our numbers. Um, obviously, as we build this world scale platform and want a lot of users, we're gonna have hundreds of thousands of assets within our world that will all serve different functions and will kind of allow you to, you know, participate in the game in various different ways. Okay, so will scarcity play in here? Um, because I'm sure you've had these conversations, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially if something sells out in 11 seconds. Um, do you feel the market's being satisfied with enough of the product in existence? Um, no, and it's a very young market and not enough people are even in it. So, you know, there's no reason why we won't have, you know, like millions of assets over time in a world that, you know, like obviously hundreds of millions of people hopefully participate in and play with. Okay. So that's really the future we're building towards. We're currently operating in a very limited kind of space, right? Where there's a small community, it's pretty like everything is really expensive. Over time, you're gonna have assets that are $50, you know, that yeah. appreciated $400 and you have kids collecting money to get them. Yeah. And you know, there's, it's gonna be a different world than where it is right now. And we're already building with that intention by okay. focusing on the app and the game and the utility of the whole, the whole ecosystem awesome. and world. So this business model isn't like Apple, for instance, we're gonna make as many phones as people want and you can lose your phone two times and there's plenty of more phones. We won't be doing a hardware focused business model. I do wanna just go back briefly for one second okay. to touch on, you know, for us, I think starting with a smaller supply of items, you know, there, are, there aren't items quite like this, right? Which are yeah. giving this game function. And what we're doing, having a smaller supply is really nice because it lets us teach our holders and our community about augmented reality. Right, we just did an incredible, really fun user-generated content video contest where we had people use the app, use the Jetpack to make fun videos. And what's coming out of that is people are starting to discover how does augmented reality work, right? Yeah. How can I have my 
my Mebit character flying around using this jetpack. People are making music videos. People are making yeah. short form films. And all of this is kind of unleashing uh, a bit of a creative chaos that we really like <laughs> that is important as we kind of march to forward into this, again, the definitive Web3 augmented reality platform. Yeah. People have to not only have the item, but they have to understand what to do with the item. And so starting with the smaller supply lets us teach more people. And what we're already starting to see is that our community members are teaching new community members. If someone gets a jetpack and has just entered yesterday, mm -hmm. their community members are like, look, here's all the crazy things you can do with that. And that, I think, is a really, really important phase to this because this is, as Asad had mentioned, going beyond simply a 10, 15 second Snapchat filter. Yeah. This is something that is a full augmented reality game world that's being built yeah. out. Awesome. So um, at its core, being an augmented reality company, um, I also know that you create uh, holograms for uh, TikTok uh, stars. So tell me how that came about, and especially uh, where do you see all of this going in terms mm -hmm. of the way that we uh, personify ourselves virtually um, and our identities? Um, because one of the, the concerns that I've had for a minute now is that in a lot of the metaverses, um, our existence is quite mechanical. It's quite boxy. Um, there are a lot of us that want to express ourselves in very unique ways, and um, it doesn't seem that the technology has yet caught up with the way that we might want to identify um, in the metaverse. And perhaps mass adoption is more about people um, really being able to identify as, as they, they would like to. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there'll be mm -hmm. uh, some aspect of that that draws more people into the space. So could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so the the holograms of kind of TikTok influencers and things of that nature, right? The way that the we transition as a company over time was you're building a lot of these festival oriented experiences that you know only a very limited number of people were actually able to access because you know they were in festivals, physical locations. Um, when we transitioned to mobile AR, because we felt that we had to do that in order to reach more people, um, our, the big question for us was what kind of AR can we offer on mobile that Snapchat and ins Instagram cannot offer, right? So um, with that in mind, we started doing something called volumetric video, which is essentially 106 cameras that capture talent from every angle and reproduce them as a three-dimensional realistic avatar. And so we did that for a year and a half and found some success with it. We worked with you know, Vic Mensa to Pussy Riot to Lil Nas X and yeah. you know, we're had a lot of you know viral videos and were, were top 30 apps on the App Store and you know we're, we were finding good traction with that model, um, but you know at the end of the day it is a limited model and it is still tied to very kind of the con the cultural continuation of the world as it exists yeah. and we felt a need to kind of move on from that. So over the last four months we've very much reoriented ourselves to be a Web3 AR company where our our focus is on you know the new paradigms that are existing out of this new ecosystem, and that's what we're excited about. That's what we're native to now. So you know we're actually going to get rid of all the holograms now, and we're going to yeah. very much uh, dive deep into you know a generative avatars and you know a world scale kind of game essentially. So just to circle back briefly also to this question of identity in the digital space, be it the metaverse or something else. Um, I think it is, it's really complicated, right? Because right now we have, from, the, from these different avatar projects, there are all these beautiful artistic interpretations of what your profile picture might look like, these different 3D avatars that could be representative, um, that really are providing a kaleidoscopic approach to this. You can be human, you can be monkey, you can be something else entirely. And you know, then there's, on the other side of things, there's this kind of photo reel recreation, which is some of our background coming from the hologram space. Okay. And I think what we've seen from you know, companies like Facebook is this idea that there's going to be these deep tranches between your work self and your play self, and how you choose to portray yourself. Maybe you're going to be buttoned up in one of these, but then you're going to look pretty wacky in, an, in your, you know, where you're hanging out with your friends. And I think you know, we, collectively we believe that there's probably a closer collision of these two things where you don't have to decide. If you want to look like a dinosaur in your work life, that's totally fine. And people are spending so much time in these digital spaces anyway, in these digital identities, and I think especially in light of the pandemic, there's a real comfort that everyone's starting to have 
of you know that the Venn diagram of work life and play life is be slowly becoming a circle um, as the tools kind of support that. So it's a good question. I don't know if there's a firm answer, but we definitely think it'll be closer to you know, if you want to flip through different identities, that's fine, but it's not going to be as archaic as work and play and family are all kind of in these different buckets that never overlap. Right. So um, Jake was actually my first producer. Um, you know, basically when uh, I was in college trying to create these AR experiences for film festivals, mm -hmm. Jake was one of the first people. He was working at Riot at that time, which is a Verizon's 5G innovation lab. Uh, he took a bet on us and actually financed our first two projects um, and we formed a really good working relationship during that time. Um, so when I could afford to hire him, we brought him over and got him over from Verizon. So he's been with us for the last eight months, but we've known each other for years now and have worked together for years. So, you know, it's a, he's producing a whole company now, not, not a one-off project. Awesome. Yeah. So you've known each other for years. Um, which does uh, bring up, I'm, I'm really curious sometimes when I talk to tech innovators, how early they were sort of in the blockchain chain game. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to me a little bit about um, your knowledge and experience of crypto? Uh, have you invested? Um, how active have you been in that space prior mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. NFTs and even in parallel with your work in AR? Sure. So um, really what our history is in is AR. And our relationship with crypto was, you know, I personally like dabbled in Bitcoin really long ago to no end result, kind of like bought a coffee from a Bitcoin back in the day kind of scenario. And then 2017, put in a thousand dollars, lost most of it. And then it was really this November that, you know, I was personally investing and I uh, invested in GRT, which was the graph protocol, which, you know, I put in a bunch of money in Christmas, it went down, but I put in enough money that I didn't want to take it out, so it forced me to learn a lot about GRT, and I learned a lot about it, and I actually got pretty obsessed with the way the protocol works, and I thought it was actually very impressive how it was working, so I decided to keep my money in, and then it shot up and actually like made me a bunch of money off that. So that was kind of my first like positive experience with crypto. And then you know we were doing our AR stuff, and essentially what happened was that Mac Boucher, who's one of our teammates uh, released the Grimes project on Nifty Gateway that yeah. did six million dollars, yeah. and you know we started paying more and more attention to it. And I was actually directing a music video for Pussy Riot, and uh, we were gonna just release it on YouTube, but we decided to release it both as an NFT and on YouTube. On YouTube, it made fifty dollars, and as an NFT, it made half a million dollars. So that once again kind of yeah. reinstated that there was, you know, new models emerging here that were worth exploring. And you know, our our we transition from being like, oh, we're making NFTs to sell to some rich people to actually like having a lot of our own net worths and just tied in NFTs. And at this yeah. point, you know, I think we're very like well immersed in the ecosystem. Yeah. And add on top of that, um, Asad's worked exclusively in augments reality. My history coming coming from Riot and a couple companies prior was a very wide range of different uh, new media from kind of like uh, headset, augments reality, mobile, virtual reality, projection mapping, um, pretty much anything you can do with interesting technology, it was, we were doing that. And I had produced at this point, um, prior to coming over to Jadu, about 40 XR projects. Wow. Um, so I'd seen a lot of different things, had tried a lot of different business models, and I think really as we got deeper into this and decided to dive full tilt into this, when we released Jetpacks, that business model made more in 20 seconds than I had made in three years in 40XR projects. And that, wow. I think, really, for me, sums up why this is special and why this is an important and interesting way that augmented reality can really take center stage in a way that is beyond simply um, these lenses, right? Yeah. So the business model and the delivery method and um, the technology are all just the serendipitous things happening um, where you just see it the perfect time and space and, and ways and means to achieve your objectives and ambitions. Yeah, and I, I think it's worth doubling down on how good mobile augmented reality has become. Like this would not work two years ago if all these other conditions were right. 
Okay. Mobile AR is really, really incredible at this point. Um, and it's, we're, okay. able, we're able to deliver on that promise beyond a filter. Okay, so can you elaborate on mobile AR as a term and what specifically you mean by that? Um, so what uh, Jake means by mobile AR is just augmented reality that happens on your phone, right? Because uh, one of the big promises of AR was that it gets rid of phones, right? Like you don't want to consume your information from a flat rectangle on your hand. You actually want to see it in your space. You want to embody it. You want to engage with it in more natural ways like you engage with your space. Um, and obviously mobile AR is a very limited manifestation of that. Um, but you know, it is still the transition point to actual AR with headsets and whatnot. Um, but I think uh, you know Jake's really right. Mobile AR is quite good right now if you know what to do with it, and not enough okay. people know what to do with it because uh, people got really tied up with Snapchat and Instagram filter creation. There's a whole ecosystem of creators that make for Snapchat and Instagram filters, but they are actually coming from a limited perspective because the tool is very limited at hand. So it actually molds your creativity to be around that those limitations. Whereas we were coming from headset-based AR, where we were just trying to do every crazy thing possible, that now we actually have a great gaming background and being able to build very compelling AR and game engines, where now with if you use, use our app, you can kind of have avatars that crash into walls and you're you know, controlling them and they can wear different assets. You know, we think of our AR as object-oriented AR. And what that entails is that everything is not compartmentalized into separate filters, but every object is an application. A jetpack is an app that your Amoeba uses to fly. And that app can be combined with a hoverboard, which is a separate app that lets it go sideways. And you know, so you can kind of layer things on top and uh, reach new um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, compatibilities and, you know, uh, connections between all these different assets. Okay, so it kind of goes back to the million products thing. Um, which makes a lot of sense now. So how big is the company? And um, I imagine you intend to scale, but um, how, how is it working now in terms of um, your workflow, mm -hmm. how quickly you're able to introduce a product on the market, et cetera? So currently we have around 14 people full time, and then we have another 10 people on top of that that are kind of contractors. So it's a substantial operation. And we've not announced this yet, but we are closing in on a round of financing, after which we'll, we will be hiring very rapidly uh, nice. to grow the company right. very quickly. Yeah. Okay. So what's uh, the future hold? Um, we know there's a big event tonight. Mm -hmm. um, do you care to talk about what is going to be unveiled um, tonight? Um, and where do you expect to go? You know, moving, like, like where do you see yourselves in five years, for instance? For sure. Yeah, so for the Dreamverse event tonight, this is going to be the first time that people are going to see the hoverboards in action. Um, we've done a slow drip of a couple different things, but this is going to be the first time that you see avatars riding the hoverboards, and it's going to be an experience where you're actually able to step into the mirrorverse, which is what we call the augmented reality manifestation of the metaverse. So you're going to be able to step into this mirrorverse space, have an avatar fly by you, um, with the hoverboard and again this lets people kind of have a really fun takeaway coming out of these experiences um, that we're really excited about uh, we've been kind of working pretty diligently on these for the last couple of <laughs> so lastly I do want to talk about that since we just touched on something um, the NFT NYC conference um, has a lot of peripheral events there's a lot of things happening around the conference which is great because the culture uh, there's a lot of um, you know communal um, events etc the one thing I am noticing um, is an ongoing exclusivity thing happening where if you don't have a certain NFT or if you do not have a certain token, you're simply not getting access to the space. Um, I find that somewhat problematic in that um, a lot of whales and influential people are gifted NFTs. They're not even buying them. Um, they're, uh, you know, they're, their hands are held and they're locked into projects. So it kind of creates a culture that's a bit nepotistic when you think about it. So I'm curious, you know, in terms of the social aspects of, you know, the metaverse, of, you know, IRL, of, you know, crypto culture in general, um, how do you see th this, you know, going? You guys are world traveled. You've probably seen other cultures where maybe this, this is uh, more prevalent. Um, I, I just, you know, off the record, I kind of just want to hear, like, what you guys think of this because you're far deeper than I am. But so to me... 
Yeah, okay, great, fantastic. Yeah, um, I'll go first, then I know you have a lot of thoughts on this. So there's a lot of parallels between this space and the growth of the XR space over the last five years. And I think one of those things is what's happening in right now, which is there are these kind of like cultural moments that happen where people gather in physical places. For the XR space, that was most of these uh, film festivals, right? So it'd yeah. be Sundance, South by Tribeca. If you wanted to, you could do these basically every month for all year long. And there was definitely, you know, everyone could go and buy tickets, but there was definitely an exclusivity component to it, which is everyone would have tickets. These were, you know, there's limited space in these venues to go see these events. Yeah. But if someone important, Robert De Niro walks up, everyone gets cleared and he's gonna walk straight on through. You know, he's the whale of the of the space, right? Um, so I think there's a, there's a fine balance to be had, right? Which is as someone who is creating these different tokens, these different NFTs, you want the people that are holding them to definitely feel rewarded for yeah. participating and believing in you and the company. Uh, I think the question is, as this scales, how do we make sure that accessibility scales with it exactly. and it doesn't remain too constrained, which I think there's definitely a version of that. Right now, everything is, you know, the price points are pretty high for a lot of these things. I have a brother who's in college right now. I would love for him to be in this space. It is financially almost impossible for him to be able to participate yeah. in a meaningful way in this. Um, and I kind of walk, I've walked around and thought, it'd be great if he could come into this party. He's definitely not gonna have whatever the NFT is that's necessary yeah. to do that. Yeah. So it's an ongoing question, but I do think that teams like Metapurse and many others are taking this very seriously. People want to solve this in a way that um, is meaningful. And if you look back at the history of virtual reality, you know, Facebook's Oculus Connect conference, pretty homogenous back in 2016. Over time, it became more diversified. So I do think there's opportunity and these types of events are the ones that kind of can provide the inflection point for people to, you know, there's something tangible. I can see you, yeah. I want you to not be stuck outside. I want yeah. you to come inside with me into this event. Awesome. Um, yeah, I completely agree. I think, uh, you know, you, this is a real problem. The problem is that, you know, rich people get richer in most systems ever, right? Like that's kind of how the world is structured. Um, but I think the opportunity here is uh, that, you know, the, the thing, for example, with crypto in general, right? Something, a system like this can only function if there are enough avenues for new people to succeed. Only then does it grow. It can't grow otherwise, right? If the people that entered early are compounding value forever, it slows down. There is just no other way, right? Because right. new people are not uh, incentivized to participate. So um, we're seeing this with Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin's existed for so long, but how many people are making life-changing money over Bitcoin that invested in it like over the last couple of months? Yeah. Whereas there are various other projects where people are actually doing that. Mm -hmm. And it is because of those projects that the space actually progresses further. And with NFTs, I think this is going to be even more important because NFTs are, NFTs are essentially like you know Dogecoin or Shiba or something, right? Like they're essentially like a manifestation of our imagination. They're perceived value. They're not actually tangible, tied to anything real. They're just a bunch of people coming together saying, "Look, this thing has this value," and yeah. that is way more malleable of a system than some coin. And when you have a malleable system, you actually can more easily manipulate how a market prioritizes what. So for example, um, when we did our minting, um, the way we did it was there was a whitelist. Uh, so if you want, wanted a jetpack, you get on the whitelist. Right. And there were some steps to do that. You have to participate in our Discord, and you know, like there are various ways to get on the whitelist. But, uh, and once again, with hoverboards, we're also gonna have a whitelisting mechanism. Okay. What it accomplishes is, it makes sure that people that end up minting, which means people that end up getting the best price possible on it, yeah. are actually people that are active participants in our community. And over time, people that are gonna be active players of our game. And they're not gonna be the whales. The whales don't yeah. have time to play games, yeah. right? So it prioritizes people that actually wanna support and give back to our ecosystem. And then they get a good price, then they are able to then sell to other people yeah. that you know might be really wealthy already. But these people get to capture that value, right? Yeah. The wealth gets distributed to people that enter 
through these means that we're setting up for them. Yeah. So as we go in, into next year, our full intention is that we're building kind of a world scale game where like a Pokemon Go style scenario where you're gonna have assets distributed all over the physical planet and people are gonna wow. have to go to physical locations to find them and mint them. So only people that travel two hours from their town to go and find this asset will get to really like kind of utilize and extract value out of it when a rich person buys it off the secondary market from them, right? And if you, I'm from Pakistan, if you end up having assets in Pakistan, you don't have that many crypto rich people there, mm -hmm. um, those people are gonna basically be able to find more rare assets because they are the hardest assets uh, to get right. you on the map, hence they then get to participate in this wealth distribution where other people then buy things off them. Yeah. That's really, really awesome. And um, I'm sure in the coding of that, you'll ensure a real democratic distribution of the rarities, et cetera, which really does redistribute well. It's That's really awesome. The, the way to do it is, you know, you have, to do, you have to find the perfect balance between rewarding existing holders, right? Because that's what creates value. A new player needs to see, oh, existing holder has created value, hence I can create value in the future. And then you need to be able to create value for them. So value kind of moves. It, it compounds for some people, but it doesn't compound forever. Um, because if it compounds forever, you have a system that's only slowing down, not a system that's getting faster. Yeah. I want to thank Asad Malik and Jake Sally of Jadu Jetpacks uh, for joining us today. It's been an awesome discussion about NFTs, crypto culture, uh, their company, and where they're headed in the future. And uh, tonight, if you can make it to Dreamverse, there's going to be a really, really rare experience. We're going to see, a, I believe, an unveiling of the actual new hoverboards, which is going to be really, really awesome. Um, I can't wait to see it. And you'll be able to find them uh, soon enough on the blockchain. So thank you. Thank you. Cheers. All right.